Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Don Albright, your host this evening. And as uh, recently popped up, we have Dan Deffenbaugh, the co-host, and Tom Howder. Um, as before, um, go to the chat and enter your uh, Masonic affiliation so we can see where you're from. And uh, this evening, Worshipful Master Tom Howder will speak about Masonic miscellanies and the foundational documents of Freemasonry in the 18th century. Um, Tom has spoken at the Lyceum more than once, and at this point, we probably almost have his CV memorized, mm -hmm. but I'll <laughs> read it for you anyway. Tom was raised a member of East Lincoln Lodge 210 in 1995. He served as master in 2000. He is a charter member of Tabula Rasa, Lodge number 332, and served as master for two years. He served as the most worshipful Grand Master of Masons in Nebraska in 2017. Tom joined the Scottish Rite in the Valley of Lincoln in 1996, serving as the Master of Kadosh for the Lincoln Consistory in 2004. He was invested a 32nd degree commander, commander of the Court of Honor in 2017. KCCH to make it simple. Masonic education and research is one of Tom's favorite subjects and he is a member of the Masonic Society, Scottish Rite Research Society, and is a founding member of St. John Lodge of Education number 331. Tom is also active in the Grand Lodge Education Committee and the Masonic Heritage Committee. He has presented with the Scottish Rite Education Series, the Grand Lodge Education Breakfast, and Masonic Education, edu excuse me, Midwest Masonic Education Conference. This evening, I think I'm just going to let Tom explain exactly what this is about because I'm beginning to bore people. But I'm going to turn my um, camera off and my mic off and I see there's a couple messages that I need to attend to so Tom take it away well, thank you very much Don uh, yeah we probably shouldn't do that every time <laughs> just say he's alive close enough uh, so brethren uh, thank you for coming tonight I see there's a bunch of people uh, popping in in the chat room anyhow which is good always good to see you Jim how's things in Texas um yeah, so tonight what I want to talk about is kind of an unusual document, which is the specific part. But in general, I want to talk about uh, how masonry was different to a great extent uh, in the first century of masonry. So when we were still in the 18th century, let's see if I did the math right here. Uh, I'm sure Dan will correct me. But in other words, in the 1700s, you would have thought that everything we, we always think that was some glorious time where everything went well and everything was right and so on and so forth. And uh, not necessarily so. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. What I have found, I've had the, the, the pleasure in the last year or so to be attending an online class on Monday nights, which, oh, ooh, I'm skipping class tonight, uh, to uh, be in this class where we look at all these fundamental documents, foundational documents that are still around. Thank goodness Google has scanned a lot of this stuff. It, it used to be very difficult to find. Now it's quite easy to find. And what you'll find is our original brethren in, the, in that first century, 1717 through the 1800s, they, they viewed masonry much differently than we do. Uh, in, in many ways, but they also have some of the same issues we have. Now, I'm not saying that they were better or worse. I'm just saying they were different, right? Their masonry was different. For example, it was a much more spiritual issue uh, for them in, in those days than we think about it now. And we're going to see some of that tonight when we look at this document. Um, however, by the same token, even though they seem to have taken it way more seriously than we do as something that should change your life and so on and so forth, but they had some of the same problems. They had recruitment issues. They had problems with uh, what we'll find uh, is referred to often as false brothers, which was a nice way of saying guys that just were showing up for the dinner and the drinking part. So it, it's kind of funny. Oh, and of course, they had already at that time uh, some issues with anti-Masonic uh, ideas from people. And we're going to look at that a little bit tonight, too. So again, not better or worse, just different, but I, I like to look at this because it gives us, uh, I think, a, uh, a new way to look at our own, 
our, our own experience of masonry. And I think there's some things we can learn there. And there's some things that are just plain completely funny. Uh, so if I can, Don, if I can share my screen here, I'm assuming I am allowed to. Ah, there it is. Now, uh, hopefully no one uh, has a whole lot of problems with motion sickness because we're going to go scrolling through this document tonight. Uh, Google does scan these things. They don't always uh, keep them straight. So as you can see, some of the pages are going to be a little wobbly. You'll also notice that this was an old enough document uh, that they're still using what's called the long S. And so it looks like an F. And so you kind of have to know what the word is, and then you decide for yourself, is that an F or an S? What would make sense sort of thing? So anyhow, this is the frontispiece of this particular book. The book we're looking at is called Masonic Miscellanies in Poetry and Prose by Stephen Jones. Now, this was printed in 1797. The reason why I wanted to start with this document is it's about at the end you know, 1717 to uh, 1797, you almost got your first hundred years in there. You're still within the same century. And so by now, there are a lot of common themes that are getting used in written material. At first, there was very little written material, of course. The first two books that were written by Masons for Masons, Calcott's Disquisitions in the book M, of course, happened much closer to the formation of the Grand Lodge. And then as the years have gone by, the decades have gone by, there are some common themes that are being um, talked about over and over again. And so I thought, well, let's start at this end then, see what we've gotten to by this time. And then in, in you know, future ones, if you want to do this some more, we'll look at some of these other documents that are a little bit more in depth. So this is the frontest page. If you look at it, you probably recognize most of the symbols. Some you may not. For example, this thing over here, assuming you can see my, my, my big mouse, that looks like a piece of chewed gum, we think is a rush ast rough ashlar, but nobody's really sure. Uh, you'll notice we have only three columns. We have seven little cherubs up here. We have some stars. We have a sun. We've got some clouds. This kind of stuff we don't even discuss anymore. It's not part of our symbolism any longer. And we can look at that at some future point too. This, of course, down here would have been Euclid's uh, 47th problem on its side and really poorly uh, expressed. But we're not sure what this little thing is up here. So we're not sure if that represents the inside of Solomon's temple or exactly what was going on. So that was the frontest piece. And here is the title page for this. Back in the day, when they did these sorts of things, one of the things that's kind of cool about 18th century uh, documents is they always have these incredibly long titles. So the entire title <laughs> is Masonic Miscellanies in Poetry and Prose containing, one, the Muse of Masonry comprising of, and they literally thought all of this stuff down to where it says by Stephen Jones was in fact the title. Uh, so... A, a little hard to catalog in your library. Exactly how you want to catalog, that's up to you. In any event, you can see this was 1797. It was printed on Poultry Street, number 31, somewhere in London. I, I, did not, I did not look up to see if Poultry Street still exists, but it wouldn't surprise me if it did. Now, this book actually is in three different sections. In the first section, The Muse of Masonry, is 170 Masonic songs. And we're going to talk about Masonic songs here in a minute. But that's section one. Section two, The Masonic Essayist, contains some letters and some essays that really touch on, for the most part, a couple of the letters are kind of strange, but for the most part, touch on common themes that were important to Masons at this time. And then part three, the Freemasons Vade Mecum, which is uh, simply Latin for come with me, is kind of a handbook sort of thing that we'll just kind of scoot through at the, at the end. I kind of wish we still printed these things uh, because it's like lists of lodges and, and Grand Lodge officers and histories and all kinds of other fun stuff. So uh, they would print these things every year. As time went on, as we get out of the 1700s into the 1800s, these vade mecums or, or handbooks as they were called or pocket books became quite popular uh, around the world and even in jurisdictions uh, in our country. So the first thing we want to do is take a look at this business about having songs. You'll notice there's cantatas, duets, glees, oratorios. There's a lot of fantastic um, toasts in here. And by the way, I should have started with this. 
If you want a copy of this book, you can go to the Nebraska Masonic Foundation.com or .org website, go under electronic documents, and you'll find it. Uh, you'll find this in there. You can download your own copy. And I, I, I really recommend you do this. It's You don't have to read it all in one setting. It's not that hard to read. But still, uh, it'll give you some great ideas. So anyhow, one of the reasons why I wanted to spend some time with the song business is uh, some Masonic authors that you read, depending on the book that you read, will claim that uh, early Masonry uh, in this period of time, you know, prior to the 1800s, was nothing but a drinking and an eating club. And they had no real philosophy. And essentially, it was party on. Well, not true. And the reason why I think this got around was because it explained things like, why were they meeting in pubs? Well, it was the only large room they could find. At this period of time, we did not have uh, very many, if at all, in most cities, purpose-built lodge buildings. You met over the, the tavern, uh, top of the tavern, because that was the only large meeting space you could get. And you knew you were going to eat and drink anyhow, because the festive board, which unfortunately uh, was taken out of American masonry, was very, very much a part of the experience and a part of the educational experience. So one of the things that people don't realize until they look at these things is that these songs, for the most part, not always, there are a couple of goofy ones in here that I haven't figured out what the message is yet, other than the literal message. But for the most part, these songs are uh, encoded education for Masons and telling you about Masonic concepts and Masonic beliefs and Masonic things. Now, why would they do something like that? Again, you're in a room over top the tavern. You're up there, you're talking, you're singing these songs to the profane down below. They think, well, now that's goofy. Uh, those guys are just having a good time. They're singing songs. I can hear the words. They don't make a bit of sense to me. So I guess they're just drinking. But in fact, it was a great way to be able to do this and pass on this information without anybody else catching on. And what we're going to look at is something called the Fellowcraft Song. And I picked this one for two reasons. One, it's, it's one of the more fantastical songs uh, because it involves fairies and imps and things like that. Uh, and also because the author uh, footnoted it so he could explain what he was talking about in the rather fantastical prose that was going on uh, in his song. So everybody hang on to your eyeballs. I got to scroll down to this. This is not fun, but there's no other good way to do it. Now, these songs, while I'm looking for this, whoops, hang on. These songs, the interesting thing about them is they say, well, sung to the tune of, and then they'll give you some tune. And the problem is, you're thinking, I don't know what that tune is either. And that, in fact, is the problem with all of this, is we don't know what most of these, in fact, we don't know what any of these tunes are. Uh, as, as far as what the music was like. And there'll be things like sung to the tune of, bleh. And it's like, well, we don't know what bleh is either. Now, there's some work being done on the East Coast. And guys, I'm going to, so I don't creep you all out, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute. And you can watch my eyeballs spin around while I try and find what I want. Um, there, there is some, some work being done on the, uh, on the East Coast with the guys from Philalethes uh, in trying to find some of this music in order to be able to, you know, bring some of this back for us. And the cool thing about that is uh, they've actually found quite a bit of it. <laughs> and there's a book that's probably going to be printed, I, I would like to say this year, hopefully. Unfortunately, they put it together during the, the time of plague. And uh, uh, they didn't want to publish it while that was going on. So well, that's the second one. And I, I apologize, this is hard for me too. I put a bookmark in it, but it's not finding it for me. So we're going to find it by eye. Talk amongst yourselves while I find this. Oh my. Hmm. Uh, Tom, to fill up some of the time, I googled Poultry Street for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's right in the center of London and uh, St. Paul's Cathedral is on uh, Poultry Street. Oh my gosh. As well as a number of restaurants. So, we're, you know, could be one of these restaurants where it's one of the places you were ta you're talking about. You never know. Well, and, you know, that is one of the, the cool things about uh, 
about <laughs> about British Freemasonry is so oh, here we go found it so much of these things because of the history and the things that have happened in London so much of these things actually do still exist and these like you know here we see that this street is still there now I doubt the printer is still there but you know but part right. of London I mean right smack dab in the middle so yeah well you know in a lot of it, it's interesting how many uh Dan it's interesting how many um uh, businesses and things were often referred to by the church that they were built up against or on the grounds of and they seem to build a lot of stuff up against the church walls like on the east side of the church wall blah 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 blah, blah on this street and then it would be somebody's business or something so uh i need to look into that more it seems like kind of a strange way to do things but i guess everybody knew where the church was at and you could see it because it had the tall spire and maybe that made it made it easier i don't know Anyhow, here's the fellow craft song. Um, <laughs> I've highlighted a few things that we're going to talk about, but let me give you the overall scope of this song. So the overall scope of this song is, huh, how to put this, there's these fairies, see, and they're little small invisible things, and they're women, but they're really keen on learning about masonry. So since they're invisible and small, they sneak through the keyhole past the tiler into the lodge, and then they hang around to learn things from masons. And they do various things. For example, they'll dance around the, you know, dance around your head. They'll dance on your, your wine glass. They'll, um, I know this is sounding odd, but there's a, hang on. There's, there's a, a good explanation for all of this. Um, and they're trying to pick up this knowledge. And you think, well, that's silly. And it, it, look at this first stanza. Come all ye elves that be, come follow, follow me. All ye that guards have been without or serve within, and yes, that's an S, come sing for joy through us, tis found that all this lodge is sacred ground. Now you see the little A there. This guy comes in with his song, and then he does this footnote business. So what he's telling you is, what this stanza is talking about is the five external senses in the ideas of the soul. This lodge is sacred ground. And that's one of the things that is very different from us, for us, I think for most of us anyway, than uh, our brethren in the 18th century was uh, a lodge truly was sacred ground. It was at the very least King Solomon's temple that you were entering. But at the most, it was often referred to as being the Garden of Eden. This was in fact sacred ground. Thus, while your Tyler is supposed to have a wavy flaming sword, you know, I'll let you look up the biblical reference for that. Dan can probably pop it out, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. There's a flaming, wiggling, fla flaming sword there. Well, because they thought yeah. this was sacred ground. In the second stanza, they, they talk uh, again about uh, these fairies. Now, these fairies, you'll see, are the five internal senses or faculties of the soul. Perception, reflection, imagination, atten in attention, and invention. So even though it says fairies are come five by five prepared, da, 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 oh, isn't that cute? What they're really now telling you is about, now there's these five external senses that we're worried about. And look at the last line, for welcome garments must be white. Ah, what do we wear that's white? Aprons. So you can see where they, they start hiding this stuff. Now, towards the bottom here, and if this isn't big enough, I can blow it up probably one more size, but we're going to lose the page a little bit. The joy, joyful noise with hands and feet shall echo and the noise repeat. And there's a little cross. Now here, here's the part where I think people got the wrong idea about what was going on. So the little cross means this is where it, you drink the following health, which means a toast. So then everybody goes, all hail the crafty sisters thrice, the dame that blows the fire, and she that weaves the fine embroidery, but chief of all, hail masonry. And then everybody, you know, chugged it, <laughs> took a big old drink. And then we went on with the rest of the song. But every so once in a while, you'll see the little cross, and that means you're supposed to do this toast thing, and they're all different. Uh, and then, you know, knock one back and move on. So as we go through this, it starts to build this story about how they're getting in and so on. In this next one that I've highlighted, it says, where cherubs guard the door with flaming sword before, we through the keyhole creep, and there we deeply peep. Over all their jewels skip and leap, or trip it tiptoe step by step. And then we look down here for F, the two keys of scripture and nature, which belong to the logos or word of rational judgment, 
whereby we distinguish truth from falsehood and evidence from darkness, etc. So this little thing that highlighted is trying to explain that really important concept right there. But if you don't know anything about masonry and no one has told you these are important things, how would you get that out of that paragraph? You wouldn't. You would just think those guys are upstairs drinking and singing about fairies. What, what's up with that? We get a little further down and there, uh, obviously the, the lodge itself is having a, a festive board because it says here, if any crumbs with all do from their table fall, with greedy mirth we eat, no honey is so sweet. And when they drop it from the thumb, we catch each supernaculum. Now, what is this talking about? Again, we go to our footnotes and we find what he's talking about, the lessons given in the lodge. These are the crumbs that are falling from the table that these fairies are trying to pick up that is so sweet because this is true knowledge. Now, supernaculum is some really bad uh, <laughs> Latin that was made up during that time. It was a drinking game. And essentially you had to drink out of your glass and then you had to turn it upside down. And if any drops fell out, then you had to drink a whole nother glass. So supernaculum referred to essentially, uh, there used to be that ad about good to the last drop, whatever coffee that was. Um, that's what they're talking about there is we catch each supernaculum. So each tiny drop, every little, every little piece of, of knowledge that we can, we're trying to hang on to. You can see in the next a uh, couple of stanzas here where there's a lot of footnotes that happen. We're not going to, we don't have time to read all those, but it's quite interesting uh, what they're talking about. So as we get towards the end here, um, yet what we hear and see in lodges where we be, not forced nor offered gold can Mason's truths unfold. Besides the craft we love, not gain and secrets, why should we profane? This is one of the great, uh, one of the great parts. So let's look at the footnote again implying that sublime truths are not obtained by any other ways, any otherwise, excuse me, than by a right study and an endeavor to find out the real sense, which being always veiled are holy, therefore, and sacred, such as are all general truths, etc. So he gets that really important concept squeezed into this tiny little stanza that essentially says you can't buy us. That is, I, I'm just, I think that's cool. All right. So as we get towards the end here, <laughs> this paragraph here is, uh, we're, we're going to have to go through the footnotes because it's, it's kind of dark, really, that when the world's at rest and snoring in her nest, when fun, excuse me, when sun has long been set and stars no rays beget, when moon her horned glory hides, their lighted tapers are our guides. And essentially what they're talking about here is the end of the world. And there's no more intelligence. If we look at the, the uh, stuff down below, state of illiterature. So this, when the world's at rest is referring to a state of, of illiterature and inactivity. And then the, when sun has long been set is the light of the gospel. Now, again, we're still in the 1700s. So it's still pretty, uh, this masonry is still pretty uh, Christian oriented. and it just is. There's Whether that's a good idea nowadays or not is irrelevant. This is the way it was then. So that's why they would bring that up. Now, stars no rays beget. Well, stars are both priests and philosophers. And what they're saying is there's no more priests and philosophers to tell us the truth or to educate us. And in the moon, which is scripture in this case, according to the learnings of time, increases or diminishes alternatively, al alternatively, to use the 18th century word, in the glory of her writers and so on. So in other words, we quit looking at scripture. And then their lighted tapers are our guides. That's us. The perfect patterns, etc., of Freemasonry. So when what they're saying is when everything else goes all to, uh, all to pot and there's no more smart people and people aren't reading anymore and they're not doing the right things, Freemasonry is still going to be there to light the way. So this song, if you go back, like I say, I really suggest you go back through the whole thing and, and read all the stanzas at some point. This is essentially a short form education in Masonic thought, but it's encoded into this weird little song about fairies dancing around on our heads and slipping through the keyhole and so on and so forth. So anybody that's not a, a Mason that hears this, they're not going to have a clue. 
Now, while I'm looking for the other one, do you have any questions on that one or any comments you want to make? Ooh. Tom, that seems pretty esoteric, but you're saying that even the people singing this knew what these, they didn't need the footnotes, they knew what the references were and it was just part of their education, is that right? Right, that's what we assume. I mean, nobody left us notes to tell us that. I mean, and think about it, if you were a new Mason, you probably would have had to been told, hey, here's what we're talking about. Uh -huh. But yes, it's, it's, it's a matter of reminding people and in, in burning in some information. Later on, we're going to see that they used to do something in lodges very unusual that I wish we would pick up again. Uh, there's a lot of repetition and a lot of, you know, just hammering in these truths about what are we about and what are we doing and so on. So yes, the, the, the concept is, as far as we can tell from the writings that surround this and so on and so forth, that the people who were singing this would have known what they were singing about. But what's so what's so interesting about this is that when you put music to words like this, there's so much there's so much easier to remember. Yes. You know? and, and, yes. and that's what we've lost in present masonry. We expect people to remember things by rote. But you 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 have a song that that kind of lifts you up and keeps you going. And, and you'll know that song within three or four, you know, uh, three of three or four singings, you might say. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you, and you've, you've hit on, on yeah, thank you very much, because you hit on something I wanted to bring up. And it's one of those things about how do people learn and how do people remember? So even in our ritual today, if you look, there's, a, there's some interesting linguistic tricks that are used where they pair stuff or triple stuff in order to make it rhythmic in hopes that that would help you remember that. But you're absolutely right. The quickest and easiest way to remember things is to turn them into a song. One of the great World War II films of all times uh, <laughs> actually uh, had this in it. Oh, uh, and yeah, I said that, and then of course I instantly forgot the uh, name of the the movie. Hmm. Oh, maybe well. Private Ryan, maybe or an old one or new one. Old one. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, oh gosh, it'll come to me. Sure. <laughs> in any event, that's what they did there. They had their attack plan and these guys were all kind of misfits and so on. And they'd been put together into this ragtag group that were going to attack this German castle. And they did it by essentially chanting or singing this song that explained what each guy was going to do at each time. And you're absolutely right. Think about it. You can remember the words to songs from your childhood, from your youth. Uh, some of you are still in your youth, so it's not that hard. But first, the rest of us, it's kind of difficult sometimes, but you can remember those words because you've heard that song. Music makes it sink in somehow. So this really makes a lot of sense that they would have done things this way. What we, we jump to here on, on page 141 is this is part of a very long one where it's not really encoded at all, but they just literally out and out have sections for each of the things they want you to, to remember. But look at how they did the writing. Look at how the, the, the language is laid out. So relief, relief of charity the soul, whose liberal hands from pole to pole extend, scorns mean restraint, disdains control, and gives alike to enemy and friend. Empty distinctions are contempt fall, for true relief is bounteous to all. So again, it's a rhyming poem, which makes it somewhat easier for people generally to remember. So some of these are very out in the open, and some of them are, are incredibly encoded, like the Fellowcraft one that we looked at. Uh, and so, unfortunately, not all of them got footnoted. So some of them, <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not it, it's encoded or, or it's just a drinking song. But for the most part, uh, people way smarter than me about 18th century English and so on have managed to figure out what the message messages are in most of these. And I think you can too. Once you read this stuff for a while, it, it actually gets a lot easier to figure out. You have to get past the F and the S thing first. Okay, so that's what this first part of the book is. It's nothing but songs and, and there's actually a little play that's in, uh, embedded in there for you and just all kinds of fun stuff like that. And it's all to do with teaching you about masonry. So let's pop on then to part two of the book called Masonic Essayist. And if you recall, I said that they were also fighting against some of the stuff that we're fighting against. And you'd think, oh man, you would have hoped the first hundred years at least would have been somewhat quiet, but no, it was not. So the first, uh, the first letter that we're gonna look at here has to do with 
uh, a vindication of masonry from a charge of having given rise to the French Revolution. So even in 1797, actually, and this was about an article in 1794, this story, this myth, this legend that somehow Freemasonry caused and, and actually controlled the French Revolution was already a, a, a thorn in their side. And this was, by the way, one of the big arguments that the Roman Church had, uh, too, at this time. And in fact, uh, actually, even up to the day in some of their stuff is, oh, it, you know, Masonry caused the French Revolution. The French Revolution caused uh, the Roman Church to lose its great control over France, for the most part. France went from being a very Catholic country to a pretty atheist country there in, in a few short years as they were trying to adjust to the concept of being a republic and, and freedom and so on. Um, however, uh, there's no credible historian that actually believes that, but there's still a lot of people that repeat it. So here we are, 1794, this guy's writing in and saying, hey, Gentleman's Magazine, a, a very, uh, you know, what a cute title for a Gentleman's Magazine. Hey, this guy wrote this letter attacking Freemasonry, and here's where he's wrong. So the first thing he does is he repeats the guy's letter. And there was this book that was written called The Veil Withdrawn, or The Secret of the French Revolution, explained by the help of Freemasonry. And of course, this was written by a French priest uh, in 1792 and uh, was quite popular. I haven't found a copy of it yet, but I am looking. And sooner or later, I know one will pop up somewhere. Uh, but that's kind of what started that thing. So this, this was a, a theory that was out there a long time ago. Now, uh, Here's a theory that I wasn't really familiar with. And then when I hit it here, oddly enough, I hit it in a modern book uh, not too long afterwards. So there is this theory out there that Freemasonry was actually concocted in a small town in Italy, Vincenza, in 1546 by this guy Socinus, or Socinius, if you, you know, Romanize his name, uh, and his buddies. Uh, in order to attack and destroy the Roman Catholic Church. I, I thought, well, that is really wacky. So Socinianism, which is actually something that's still out there, and again, Dan could probably give us a nice lecture on it, but essentially uh, they don't believe in the Trinity business. So they're anti-Triune, right? They didn't have anything to do with creating Freemasonry, <laughs> but this, is, this was a very popular uh, idea back then. I was asked to review a book earlier this year that was written in 2021 that I thought was going to be a good book until I found out the author, who was not a Mason, had bought into this and spent enormous amounts of, of ink trying to justify this goofy theory that it started in Italy as a method to take down the church. So just a little historical thing. You can look into this more but uh, it's just one of those things that when you read it, you just think, uh, how do you explain uh, all of Great Britain? So who knows? Oh, and then just for, for those of you, I can, I can say this without uh, being taken to Masonic trial, I hope. Um, so what they call the watchword is what we would have called the master's word. And this is what it used to be. And you'll see this in a lot of documents, oddly. So strangely enough, it's in a lot of documents and they talk about how you should never tell anybody this word and then they print it. Wow. I, I can't explain that, theory, that, that logic, but there it is. So if you ever see that word, that's what the master's word was in the 1700s. All right. All right, I gotta go to the next letter. Anything before we hit the next letter? Okay. We will keep going. You want to talk about footnotes. This is a footnote. <laughs> uh, so you'll find in our class, we were more excited about the footnotes oftentimes than the, the actual text because the footnotes were better. The, you have to get used to this style of writing. I suggest reading a lot of Dickens, uh, Jane Austen, things like that first to get used to how they write things. And um uh, and then go to the sort of thing. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to, to say about that before we leave uh, number one is the other, the other common uh, theory that, that anti-Masons have is uh, accusing us of being deists. And this is a real easy one to solve for you. Um, deism, 
we open and close with a prayer. We pray, we pray before all kinds of stuff. We're even told that you're supposed to pray if you're going to do anything important. Deists don't pray. So we can't be deists. So that, that whole argument is just incredibly silly. So when you see that, just discount it and let it go. Okay, letter number two. This one is cool. Um, because the guy who wrote this book was a disciple of Preston. And so he was always trying to pimp Preston stuff. And so you'll notice he never says Preston out loud, but he says, addressed to the author of the illustrations of masonry. Well, anybody who was anybody uh, that was a mason would know who he's talking about. And so he starts talking about this wonderful Masonic system that's available to us from this guy. But this is the paragraph that is interesting. Earlier, I mentioned they had this problem that they refer to as false brethren or a false brother. This is somebody who was just showing up for the food and drink, didn't really catch on uh, to what masonry was about, never let it change his life, never tried to live it. He was just kind of the party boy of the group. And here's what he has to say about that. It is to be lamented that to the suggestions of some weak minds among our fraternity, and that in the 18th century was a tremendous burn to call somebody a weak mind right? The prejudices of the world against our invaluable institution are in a great measure imputable. Unable to comprehend the beautiful allegories of ancient wisdom, they ignorantly assert that the rites of masonry are futile and its doctrines inefficient. So this is kind of the first level of people, uh, of actual masons, are those that think, you know, and, and a lot of authors picked up on this and still say this, that, oh yeah, early masonry didn't have any philosophy, didn't have anything going for it, it was just a drinking club. Okay. To this assertion, indeed, they give by their own conduct a semblance of truth as we fail to discern that they are made wiser or better men by their admission to our mysteries. So in other words, they don't get it, and they're proving that they don't get it by continuing to live the way they were living before they were made masons. So nothing has been improved. Nature alone can implant the seeds of wisdom, but masonry will teach and enable us to cultivate the soil and to foster and strengthen the plant in its growth. So he puts out this burn to people that aren't trying to actually learn about masonry as a way of life, as a philosophy, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a paradigm to live your life by. Now think about it, already at this point, they're having problems thinking there's people like that, that they've accidentally left in, you know, led into the craft. No wonder we still have problems. It's human nature. We always, will have these things with us. It's just weird to see them, uh, to me anyhow, in this earlier document. All right, um, so that's that letter. Number three, this one is cool. This is one of those things I think should be printed and handed to everybody right after they're raised. <laughs> and uh, what it's about is a, 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 friend, a friendly remonstrance to a skillful but overzealous Mason. So the point of this letter is, don't get too wrapped up in masonry, right? We, when we come in, we're all super excited and so on. And next thing you know, you want to do everything. I want to be on all the committees and I want to learn ritual and I want to go to all these different events and I'm visiting every lodge in town. And that's, that's good to a certain extent. But what this guy is trying to tell the young mason is that you never suffer the business of masonry to interfere with the more necessary vocations or duties of life, which are on no account be neglected. Why? Because the time drawn from business never can be redeemed. So he's trying to tell him, you know, that's great, but just dial it back a little bit because you've got a life. And we see this in our ritual. This actually becomes a part of our ritual. Um, this, thus then, when a man becomes a Mason, he sees if he be a sensual man, the pleasures of the table to indulge his appetite and the splendor of decoration to gratify his sight. So those are the guys that are just here for the fun. If on the other hand, he be a thinking man, he enters an ample field for contemplation. He receives the lesson of morality and of virtue and is taught by an early and pleasant process to diffuse its blessings among mankind. If he is a good man, he will illustrate the precept by his own conduct in life. So here he has split us up, members up into three kinds, right? The person who doesn't get it, that's just there for the food and drink. The person who kind of gets it and is contemplating the living daylights out of things, right? And then the person who goes beyond that and actually lives his life that way. So that's kind of, you know, hey, I'll be darned, three things. Where do we see the number three constantly, right? So it's like climbing a little mountain 
to a certain extent. And he has actually uh, gone ahead and, and separated people out in these things. So essentially what he's telling this guy, it gets, it gets through some other issues, uh, but he gets down to don't seek titles, don't, don't overspend your time in masonry, uh, and remember you've got a family at home, and so on. Any questions about that one? Comments? Cool. All right. Uh, letter four. This is one that I think should be printed and given to everyone, uh, whether you were raised yesterday or you were raised 50 years ago. Uh, this, this really hits home. And this is by the editor of the book, so Stephen, and he is talking about virtue. Now, virtue, as it was defined back then, is somewhat different than the dictionary definition we'd have now. And I'll let you look that up on your own. It's, it's pretty interesting to look into that. There's some places online where you can go and see how words have changed and, and so on through the centuries. And uh, it's kind of interesting. But the thing is, virtue is something that is, to this editor, to this author, uh, one of the primary things about masonry to be worried about. So what's he talking about here? He comes down here and talks about how we need to live a virtuous life. And he says this, to draw together by the pure principle of our order, a select number of brethren from the fraternity at large, who properly impressed by the tenets of the profession, shall have courage to carry them into practice and make them the unerring guide of their conduct through life. Now, that is a, a pretty... A uh, specific thing to say, and that's a pretty specific group of people. What he's saying is somewhere out there, there's got to be a select number of brethren that actually get it and actually have the courage to live their life the way Masonry wants them to. Earlier in the letter, he admits that we don't all, and it's almost impossible, and certainly we don't all live up to what we, what we say we are as Masons. And I think that's true today. It's, it's, we're human. It's almost impossible, right? But he's saying that somewhere there's got to be a group of guys that can actually do that. And those are the people that we need to be seeking out. Because then people would see masonry for what it is, this wonderful thing. A little later on, <laughs> uh, he says something. I, I thought maybe this guy had been reading my notes, but uh, that would have been hard without time travel. In the pages of that work, I read with avidity the rudiments and pursued in idea the perfection of religion and morality. But theory without practice, though it may attract admiration, will never gain respect. To be honored, in short, to be useful, a system must have the qualities of stability, of practicability, and of effect. Now, theory without practice. And I will apologize ahead of time. I don't mean to uh, insult anyone, but one of the things that's happened in masonry over the past probably century uh, or so is we have a lot of people that can repeat the words flawlessly, but they don't know what they mean. They don't know why they're saying them. And oftentimes they don't live them, right? So that's theory without practice. And apparently it was going on back then too. So yes, it's admirable. Believe me, I can't, I can't repeat all the ritual flawlessly. I can't even get close. Uh, I'm horrible at ritual. However, do you know why you're saying those words? So yes, there's admiration, but if you wanna be honored, if you want masonry to be something that people really think something of, it has to have these qualities of being stable. In other words, truths that are always truths and aren't changeable. Practicability, they have to teach you things that you can actually do, not some, some uh, super important uh, you know, thing that's beyond humans, and it has to have an effect on you. I love that paragraph. I mean, that just really sums up the struggle to actually be a true Mason, and pro probably why that's why we don't while we're still alive, because again, we're human. So then he gets to this part, and, and this, this part really nails it home. Our society, my brethren, can only acquire its proper rank in the scale of human institutions by a general and faithful observance of its own precepts. And if this cannot be affected in its corporate capacity, very much may be expected from the junction of well-disposed individuals who shall be inclined by the constant tenor of their lives to recommend the profession and to prove that Freemasonry is only another term for inflexible virtue. Talk about setting a standard that is way out there for, for I would think most of us inflexible virtue. That's pretty harsh. 
But he's saying that's what we're trying to reach for, and that's what we should be reaching for by studying masonry and be, being involved in it, the constant tenor of our lives. So again, it's not just that you got the membership card and you can blurt out the words, but are you living this? And notice it's a profession. Wow. I mean, think about what the, profe the word profession means, you know, profession. But inflexible virtue, that's a standard that's, that's almost uh, unachievable, but it's a great target. I mean, if you ever feel like, for whatever reason, you ever feel like you don't have any more goals in Freemasonry to accomplish, see if you can't get in on this inflexible virtue thing. Uh, and then let me know, because I need to learn. Because uh, obviously, I'm human, and I don't know how to do that. But it's a great, it's a great goal to go for. Okay. After that, some of these letters, like this one, reasons for having become a Mason in a letter to a lady, please skip over that. Uh, misogyny was uh, rampant back in those days, or at least we would uh, consider it to be misogyny at this point. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it's like everything in the 18th century. Women aren't smart enough, da-da-da-da-da. It's like, yeah, sure. Okay, so we're going to go down here then to the third portion of this book called the Vade Mecum which again means go with me. Here we go. And it's got all kinds of cool stuff in it. And we're just going to kind of go whipping through this because I'm running out of time and I want to take your questions. I see we have some questions and stuff in the, in the chat. But in the third section of the book, uh, this is kind of the beginning of these so-called pocket handbooks that became very popular then in the 1800s. But we start with remarkable events in masonry. And you'll notice the first one they have, 287, St. Alban, formed the first Grand Lodge in Britain. I'll let you do your own research and figure out whether or not that has any mm, truth or, or has any traction to it. Because then you got King Athelstan granted a charter to Freemasons in 926. That's the York right thing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see this. And when they would do these histories, they would bring them right up to the to the day they were writing it and tell you who the current Grand Master was. So they left nothing out when they did these histories. A couple of fun things here in this history, or at least one that I found, the Grand Chapter of the Order of Harodin uh, was instituted in 1787. Now, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the issue with Harodin, if you haven't heard of it. Preston uh, got crossways with the craft, well, some people in the craft, uh, at a particular time, uh, and from 1779 to 1789, he was actually ejected from the craft, and it, it was on trumped-up charges. Um, essentially, he was charged with being in an unauthorized procession, and what they were doing was they went to a church service in apron and collars and cuffs and things, and then they walked across the street without cha changing out of that to their where their lodge was held, and somebody said, oh, that's a procession, and narked him out, and so he left and he created this, this uh, concept, this fraternity called Harodim. And I'll be darned, it was trigradal. Hmm. It had lectures, it had charges, it had ritual. It was pretty much his idea of Freemasonry based on everything that he knew. And this lasted till about 1800, right after about the turn of the century, it, it eventually uh, went away because by that time they had taken him back in and then you know, everybody kissed and made up and so on. But it, it's an interesting part of his history and, and uh, something I suggest you all look into at some point. It's, it's fun to read about it. So anyhow, here we go through history, da, 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 da. And then we get up to 1790. Hey, Frederick, Prince of Wales, look at that. <laughs> so they, they bring it right up. Then we have your, your present grand officers, uh, provincial grand masters, which is something they have that we don't. Um, this section, though, is really interesting from here down. This is how to constitute a lodge. And if you read this, you will find out that the language used in these ceremonies, and he would have lifted these from Anderson's Constitutions, the, the, uh, the first issue, 1723. The language in here is virtually the same as the language we use today. So interestingly enough, for all the other things that we've changed in masonry, we've changed the, ma the master's word, we've changed all these other things, these kind of things we have copied almost 100% almost complete from 1723. 
And I, I just, I get such a kick out of that. I think that's cool. For example, I present my worthy brother, brother AB to be installed master of this new lodge and know him to be of good morals and of great skill, true and trusty and a lover of the whole fraternity. Wheresoever dispersed over the face of the earth. Have you ever heard that before? If you're paying attention at an installation, yeah. And then they go on, here's the things that a master is supposed to be. And guess what? It's the same things word for word that we tell our masters. Now, except for the part about being uh, somewhere in here, one of these has something to do with uh, the king and the queen. And you now we just, we, we don't do that anymore, but nonetheless, uh, most of this is exactly the same. So it's fun to read and find pieces of ritual that you recognize and go, oh my gosh, that, that's how old this is that we're doing. Here's something that I wish we would bring back. When you opened a lodge, you rehearsed a couple of things. And the first thing was this bit about on the management of the craft in working. And essentially it reminds everybody how they're supposed to act in lodge and who they're supposed to be. The most expert craftsman is chosen or appointed master of the work and is duly honored by those over whom he presides. Now, and it's still illegal today, but it was illegal in these days to have an advancing line and just advance somebody because he'd been in the chair before that. And that's still illegal under UGLE laws today. They literally have to have uh, uh, an actual, I mean, we have nominations and, and uh, you know, we do a vote and everything, but we all know that most all lodges do a, an advancing line. They were very much against that. They were very much about the concept of the, the uh, most skilled person or the most intelligent person or the most educated person, whatever, however you want to put it, that's who should be master. And they didn't necessarily have to work their way up uh, through all these other, all these other uh, chairs. So they would read that. And then they would do this one about salute each other in a uh, courteous manner. And then for some reason, there was this charge placed in the middle of it. We're not quite sure whether this was read with the other stuff or this just kind of got plopped in here. Uh, again, it's pretty much a copy of the 1723 Anderson Constitution version, but it starts out with this issue of the privileges of masonry have been made too common. Good grief. We're still in the 1700s and people are worried about that. They have been bestowed upon the worthless and the wicked and the reputation of the society has been injured. And then we get this little thing about in a lodge, Masons meet as members of one family, all prejudice on account of religion, country or private opinion is therefore removed. And that's probably something we should remind ourselves of every time before we have a, a meeting. So they open the meeting by reminding everybody of the rules and what we're there for and how we're supposed to act. And I, I think that's pretty neat. I think that would be nice to remind ourselves uh, of that sort of thing. Then they also have uh, charges. You'll find the charges to be pretty much the same. For example, here's the, the uh, fellow craft charge. Note that the stuff that are in the brackets, sorry, I can't point at my screen. I need to use this, don't I? The stuff that's in the brackets here is optional, <laughs> which is weird because we just took the whole thing for ours. Geometry or masonry, originally synonymous terms, being of divine and moral nature, da, 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 da. Any of you that can do the fellow craft charge or have ever heard it ought to recognize that paragraph. And here we're still using that same language. Only for some reason, they were given the chance to actually throw some of that out. If you take out all the stuff in the brackets, the charge for the fellow craft gets pretty short. Uh, this I think is interesting. Uh, in America, due to all the stuff that happened uh, around the uh, anti-Masonic era and, and all of that in the Baltimore Convention of 1843, yada, 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 we have always opened in the master's degree and only masters typically are allowed to speak and vote and so on. Everywhere else in the world, uh, if, if you're an EA, it doesn't make any difference. You can say something. And so here they're talking about that in our private assemblies as a craftsman. And they're not saying fellow craft, just everybody is a craftsman in general. Once so you get EA, fellow craft, master mason, you're a craftsman. You may offer your sentiments and opinions on such subjects as are regularly introduced in the lecture. Now, in the old days, it was the master's job to educate the lodge, and every meeting had to have some sort of lecture from the master about something, either Masonic. Sometimes it was about, uh, if you look in the records, I mean, they went to all kinds of non-Masonic things, you know, like how do you correctly shear sheep? 
or you know why does the price of gold fluctuate the way it does or whatever there was always some educational component that happened and that was the master's job and what they're saying here is hey guess what you get to open your mouth and and include yourself in that uh, we now can open in any degree we want to, to allow all of our members to come which i think is great and i think we really need to emphasize that they can raise a hand and say, I don't understand, or I don't agree, or whatever. Um, it, it's all about learning and sharing. And then, of course, there's the third degree. And then my favorite part of this section is the very last page. Oh, so here's all the lodges and when they meet and everything around London and around England in general. <laughs> so, And some of these probably still exist. In fact, a great number of them do, I'm sure. Yeah, let's get to my favorite page. Ah, so the very last page of the book is this one. It's an advertisement for his next book. <laughs> so even in those days, you had to make a buck. So the Freemasons pocketbook and Universal Daily Ledger is coming out. So it's kind of like a date book, right? But it had all this other information in it. And we actually used to do that in this country. The, la the oldest one I've seen that we have in the, the library museum is from the early 60s. And then they don't really publish them after that. But you'll notice all the fun stuff that's in there. But I've highlighted this other thing that I'm not sure everybody's going to understand right away, a variety of useful tables. Now, what would that be? Well, keep in mind, this is 1794, 97. So end of the 18th century, all lodges are still lunar lodges. So you had to know when the full moon was so you knew when to go meet because you had to be able to walk there, or ride your horse or drive your little buggy or whatever. And that's difficult to do when there's no moon out. So one of the things that was always included in these pocketbooks for, for decades upon decades until we, <laughs> we got electric lights and things was the moon tables. So you could figure out when things were gonna be full moon and when they weren't. So that brings us to the end of this and, and to kind of just put it all together in a ball. That's why I find these so interesting to look at is there are a lot of similarities, and yet there are a lot of things that are different from what we used to do. And I think we can appreciate, I think it, we need to take time to appreciate what they went through in building our fraternity, what we're going through and say, hey, we could learn from this, or boy, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. At some times, some Masonic stuff is really quite, um, quite embarrassing to the to 21st century people as far as how they discuss people and, and race issues and so on and so forth. But the cool thing is, is masonry, which is unchangeable, actually changed. And we learned to get rid of some of the lesser things, some of the lesser angels of our nature while things were going on. And we probably have more to do along those lines. But these things will give you a, a wonderful, wonderful look into how things were at the very beginning. And guys, that's it. So what do we have for questions or comments or whatever? Tom, there were a couple of questions earlier. Um, <clears throat> I think the earliest one was, uh, most worshipful Tom, you used the word spiritual to describe 18th century masonry. Was it overtly Christian or did Freemasonry take on a more overtly Christian mantle with, the Rob, Mor with Rob Morris in the 1870s? Ah, excellent question. And, and by the way, so I don't forget this, yes, most worshipful brother Ron Stites, it is the Dirty Dozen. <laughs> that, that was the movie I was referring to. Okay. Uh, excellent question. Early Freemasonry was overtly Christian. And this kind of makes sense considering where it, it popped up, obviously, right? So we think that the true, the, the true uh, speculative part of it, anyhow, probably started in Scotland, spread through England, and then kind of reverberated back as an echo. The English made a much better job of, of regularizing things and so on and so forth. So when did it become, oh, and this is really weird too, is because although it's overtly Christian and the prayers typically uh, will bring up Jesus, uh, those sorts of things, or the Trinity, that sort of thing. Um, but by the same token, they talked a lot about tolerance. And it's like, well, we tolerate other religions. We just only know, apparently the guys who wrote this didn't know how to pray any other way than as a Christian. So that kind of, it's kind of a weird dichotomy. It wasn't until after the reassembly of the Grand Lodge from ancients and moderns into what we call the United Grand Lodge of England in the 1800s that uh, quite a bit of the overt Christianity was removed from it. 
And I wish I could remember the document I found this in, but uh, that was kind of, by that time, there were a lot of Jewish lodges and the lead rabbi or head rabbi, I don't know what the correct title is, rabbi of, of London actually asked the Grand Lodge, you know, could you tone it down a little bit? And it's interesting because when the ancients and the moderns were split apart, the moderns always accused the ancients of being anti-Semitic. And yet in the ancients constitution, known as the Ahiman Rezon, which is something else we should talk about someday, actually have a section called prayers for a Jewish lodge. And they have prayers that are for a Jewish lodge that makes sense for that, for that um, religion. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of mudslinging going on, but like I say, by the time they put the, the Grand Lodge back together and decided we're all one big lodge, they managed to get some of that out of there. Now, there's still quite a bit in it, obviously. Um, and in talking to Jewish brothers, they kind of, they have different opinions about it, but generally aren't, it's not, a, it's not bothersome enough that they want to leave masonry because they see other things in masonry that are very universal. Um, it's, it's interesting as, as uh, we have a brother here in town, Matthew Parker always says it is, is that the guys who wrote our ritual seem to know a lot about Jewish history, but never knew a Jew, because they seem to have misinterpreted some of it, you know, in, in his opinion, as a, as a, uh, as a Jew. So, you know, but so that's where, yeah, it started, it was very, very Christian in the very beginning. There's a, another question from uh, Jim Marples. Uh, is it known? It is it known as whether the Mace Masonic es, excuse me is it known whether the Masonic essayists tended to be associated with ancient universities? From all accounts, it is evident that many of them were well-educated men. Excellent point. So, uh, here's one of the things that's kind of mm, things change over the centuries. Freemasonry, or Freemasonry originally was not meant for every man, okay? So part of the issue with the split between the ancients and the moderns had to do with how to actually um, experience masonry as the burgeoning middle class was growing in England. Prior to that, there was no middle class. You had the, uh, you know, rich educated people and you had the people that were definitely not, right? And there was no middle class in between. As there became to be a middle class due to uh, things like, you know, they, they started colonizing everywhere and business became uh, incredibly important. And so you have all these powerful businessmen, they started wanting to get into masonry as well. So, uh, yeah, if you go back far enough and you look at this stuff and you look at the people who, if you look at the lives of the people who wrote these things, like this guy, for example, you'll find that, yeah, typically they were very well educated people. This is not anything that just, you know, uh, Joe Bagadonis decided to sit down and, and write about. This was something uh, considered very, very high end. Yeah. Uh, well, I was looking through the list that you showed of the dates, and it's interesting. You remember I, I told you that Poultry Street still exists in London, and uh, it's the street on which St. Paul's Cathedral is built. And in that list, I think in 1713, it says St. Paul's Cathedral completed by Masons. Hang on. We'll find, oh, I got to find that. Yeah. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And guys, again, I, I just want to emphasize that you can find this book and a bunch of others. This Saturday, we re-released, so to speak, uh, or re-released a new section of the website at the Nebraska Masonic Foundation which can be found at nebraskamasonicfoundation.com or .org called Electronic Documents. And in there, it's books that I've, I'm scanning out of the library, uh, some of which are really cool. And uh, also documents like this that I've gotten through this class I've been taking. And so pop over to that site and start digging through there. There's even, uh, there's even a really fun, um, what year are we looking for, Don? Dan? It's right there. It's uh, 17, uh, 17, uh, 1713. St. Paul's completed oh, by free, Freemasons. Yeah. yeah. Ah, the highlighting tool doesn't want to work, but um, okay. So yeah. So anyhow, one of the other things that uh, you'll find this document there, and then I should finish the sentence before we go to St. Paul's here, but there's uh -huh. also, uh, we have a couple of novels, <laughs> Masonic, and there's this really cool one called 
uh, something about King Solomon or the Freemason's daughter. And uh, it's this young girl who goes to the big city. And of course, you know, the evil big city people are taking advantage of her. But then she has this Masonic thing that her, her father gave her and she shows it to the right people. And then all of a sudden, all these Masons are taking care of her. It's, it, it's a real, it's a real, uh, you know, heavy breathing kind of 18th or, or kind of Dickens kind of thing. A lot of, a lot of heaving bosoms and breathless exclamations and stuff. Well, but it also plays into the fantasy of the knight saving the, the damsel in distress, doesn't it? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Which was very important to them. There was a lot more credence in, in, in those days put into the, by some people, anyhow, uh, a great number of people uh, into the whole thing that, oh, we're actually all Knights Templar and, you know, so on and so forth. Research wasn't that great back then. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, what's his face? Um, Chevalier, mm, Ramsey. Ramsey had written that thing uh, about, oh yes, we're all Knights Templars and here's why and, and concocted this whole history that has very little fact, but a lot of, of uh, wish, wishful thinking in it. And that was very big. So yeah, it really does play into, you know, how, and that's the thing about reading these documents. How did they see themselves? And they really saw themselves as, as a class apart from everyone else and not in a look down on you kind of way, but in a look at me, I'm trying to make myself better way. And, you know, we've got it figured out over here. Now, if, if things, you know, uh, hit the fan and everything will still be around, we'll still be here to tell you how to do things. So uh, it's, it's a very different mindset. I want to encourage people to, to either in the chat or in the questions and answers, you can uh, put your question. Uh, Russ Reno says, uh, please state again the website address to find the book and describe some of the other information available there. It's at Nebraska. Which, which I just did, yeah. So Nebraska, uh, bleh, Nebraska Masonic Foundation.com or .org, either way. And uh, when you scroll down, you'll see there's uh, actually, you know what, duh, I guess I could share yeah, my screen can, and show you, couldn't I? Well, I can, cut, I can cut and paste the link into the chat too, if you'd like me to do that. Please. Okay, thank you. It'll take me a minute, so you can go on and talk. That's okay, this will <laughs> take me a minute too. <laughs> okay, I gotta stop that share, and then I gotta start a new share. Sometimes mouth moving, brain not thinking. Okay, so here's the website. And there's a bunch of cool stuff here for you. So on the first line here, this is our book database. So if you wanna see what books we actually have in the collection, you can pop in there and do a search and all that kind of stuff. Object database, this is the physical objects that we have in the cases and so on. Uh, objects archives, these are things that don't fit in the cases, typically like patents and, and certificates and, and uh, charters and stuff like that that we may have in the collection that, that are, are paper-based, ba paper based, but not in a book form. And then, of course, we have what we're talking about tonight, the electronic documents and books section. Before we leave there, you can request a visit. If you want to hold lodge there, you can have the Grand Master uh, give you dispensation to move your charter. Uh, and you, I'm happy to have, I'll set it up for a lodge for you. And then we can do a tour afterwards. Or if you just want to come in for a tour for something for your lodge to do before or after dinner, let me know. Happy to do that. If you need help with research, if you want to donate something, so on and so forth. And then, of course, if you really want to donate something, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> and that's what this section is about down here, including naming a bookcase. So we still have six bookcases that you can name after yourself. Uh, the naming lasts for 10 years or longer if I don't remember to take it down in 10 years. So, Tom, it knows. occurs to me that this would be an excellent presentation at some future date, just introducing people to this, uh, this website and everything, because I see that you can donate objects, uh, you know, all these lodges that are closing across the state. This is where they can at least you know, uh, ensure some sense of longevity or immortality, however you want to put it. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, in fact, you, yeah, once again, your great minds think alike, you're way ahead of me. And, I, and next time you guys need a program, uh, something like this, I, I would love to give people a tour uh, of this website. 
We're, we're now in the electronic documents section. This is, uh, I'm going to come back to some of these things, but this is just some of the most read things. If you're looking to learn about Nebraska Freemasonry, start here with Russ's book. I mean, it's absolutely indispensable. I use it all the time as a starting place to go find deeper information. So he went through all the proceedings from 1857 to 2007, took out the greatest hits, uh, so to speak, and put them in this book. And it's got this wonderful index that allows you to find stuff easily. We still have a couple of boxes of these available at the Grand Lodge if you want to buy a hard copy. Um, and he will autograph it for you for the low, low price of, no, he'll, he'll autograph it for free. But um, <laughs> there is some guy that's been trying to sell a copy of this on eBay for at least the last couple of years that trying to sell a copy of this for a hundred bucks or 90 bucks or something like that. It's like, uh, no. All right. So anywho, when we go to the second page here, electronic documents, we will find some categories of documents, as you can see, one of them being, these are the books that I've scanned from our collection so far. These two right here, if you want to start learning about early Freemasonry and how they felt about it, Colcott's Disquisition and the book M are the two you want to read. They're not easy reads. They're not long reads, but they're not easy reads because of the language and because of the concepts. Uh, these, guys, these guys were writing some heavy stuff. Okay. Collected Essays of Gould from 1913. This, uh, Robert Freak Gould was the uh, Mackie of England. So, you know, like we have, you know, Mackie was writing encyclopedias and this and that and the other thing. Yeah, well, Gould did it for England. So that'll give you a better idea of what was going on in English lodges at the time. So these are the ones that I have scanned so far. Then we have what I like to call foundational manuscripts. And so these are the various manuscripts going back as far as we can. Uh, we've got the Anglo-Norman charges in 1356, and then we kind of work our way forward alphabetically. Um, and then we have some other, here's the book we were looking at tonight, for example. And if you click on it, you, it should pull it up in your browser. It's a PDF. You can download it. You can read it in your browser, whatever makes you happy. You that link that. has been... That link has been posted in chat in case no one or anyone hasn't seen it yet. Right, and then let me show you, if you go under miscellaneous, here it is, the signet of King Solomon or the Freemason's daughter. Now, he followed this up with this fabulous novel here, Low 12. Mm. <laughs> and that's, yeah. kind of a, that's kind of a mystery sort of thing. So uh, you just don't see that kind of stuff anymore. What we don't have here, because I haven't scanned it yet, is back in the day, they, they, McCoy printed a whole bunch of plays, and we have the scripts for these plays, and it gives the staging and all, the whole nine yards. So if any of you out there are, are you know, thespians and uh, want to put on a Masonic play, let me know, because we've got four or five of them in the, in the museum right now. Are there any other questions? I, I'm sorry, I'm the only one talking and I apologize for that. I don't know how I can get people on the, on the microphone. If there are, please type those into the chat. Uh, Tom, um, being a person who has seen the tour of the museum, the Grand Lodge Museum, I, I think that is something that you might um, offer that people maybe i mean <clears throat> through the lyceum uh, people may be interested as a tour of the uh, museum a virtual tour absolutely and like i say you can uh contact me set up a time uh, happy to show you everything in there and what we know about it we don't have provenance on a lot of our stuff so we've had to guess <laughs> on quite a bit of it but some of it we do know where it came from and how old it is and, and there are some amazing objects in there. We still have our, our piece of the White House from the 1950s when they were remodeling. Um, we have pieces of the very first lodge in Nebraska, the, the uh, Sarpy's building that was a log cabin. We have a gavel made out of that wood. And so we have some really, really cool stuff to look at like that that we can talk about. And of course, you just get to be around tons of really cool books. We have about 2,000 volumes right now in the library. And the majority of them are from the 18th century. 
Now we have a lot of stuff that uh, it just, it's just amazing that it's still in one piece. We have some of it that's falling apart that we need to deal with, but uh, quite, a, quite a bit of it is still in good shape and therefore I'm able to scan it and you know, preserve it forever. But uh, it's, it's just amazing. Typically when people pass away, their family, if they're not Masonic, will just bring their big box of their stuff in and drop it off and say, here you go. And uh, I always go scrabbling through it like, like a squirrel looking for a nut because occasionally you'll find a book that we don't have or uh, a really old uh, monitor or something we don't have. Most of the monitors from the year they were printed forward, but not all, we're missing a few. So, you know, cool stuff gets found. Um, Tom, I'm going to step in. Um, I Go don't ahead. see anything new in the Q&A in the chat. Um, if anyone wishes to speak, I can turn your mics on just a moment. I will. See if I can catch as many people as I can. It's always easier to ask questions when you don't have to type them, but you can actually speak. Uh, nobody's taking the bait, Tom. Well, that's not unusual. I've gone way over time, and I apologize for that. But this is just exciting stuff to me. It's uh, it's been a real revelation to see these new these these old documents and be able to see what people you know think. Plus, we're pretty excited about our website now at the foundation because of all the cool stuff 